This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Think Tech Hawaii. And with me today in the studio is Dr. Sonia Rowley. Welcome again, Sonia. Nice Hello. to have you back. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. We're going to be talking about Sonia's research today, and Sonia works on coral, something that's very likable uh, for all science, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we all like our coral here, and our coral in the Pacific is certainly facing some interesting challenges these days. And uh, Sonia's work takes uh, a, a very interesting uh, slant on that because you look at fairly deep coral, or coral is at least deeper than we used to think coral thrived, right? Right. Yes, I uh, primarily work on a group of uh, something called Gorgonian corals, um, octocorals, and they are octo meaning eight, and why they're different to say like the, the corals that you would get on the reefs, they're kind of hexacoralina. So they are from a group that has multiples of six tentacles or more, where octocorals have eight tentacles or more. Very simple. Right. And the thing is with Gorgonians is that they are predominantly shaped like a sea fan, so they're often just called sea fan. Um, and they go all the way down to the abyssal plains. You'll get them to the shallow waters down to the abyss. Um, I, a lot of my research is conducted using closed circuit rebreather technology down to 500 feet. Um, I also use um, the subs uh, from Hurl as well as part of my research. So, um, so yeah, so there's all sorts of different types of coral mm -hmm. uh, per se, and, um, and they're, they're extremely fascinated, fascinating, and they really um, help us see um, how we are affecting the environment. Right, because uh, the ocean temperatures are rising in general, yes. right? And the ocean is, meanwhile, becoming more acidic all the time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, probably at much more rapid rates than are, are typical of, of, or of the norm. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is, you know, has potentially some very bad effects on, on coral, right? I mean, coral uh, cannot establish itself if, if it's in a too acidic environment, right? Right. I mean, different coral species and different coral groups mm -hmm. um, do respond in different ways. Sure. And there's lots of really seminal research going on, especially at HIMB, with regard to these different responses. And um, one, the, the group that I work on with the Gorgonians, they are extremely old in the paleontological record. Mm -hmm. And so their recent common ancestors are about 400 million years old. And you will find um, a lot of certain species in what we call oxygen minimum zones um, around the different oceans of our planet. They are extremely biologically successful. And the majority of these species are azoxanthellate. Um, and what I mean by that is they don't have the symbiotic algae than um, what you have in the corals that you see out in the reefs here in Hawaii. Right. Now, you do have species that do have zooxanthellae, mm -hmm. um, but the, the, a lot of them do not. And those are the ones that you have at depth, because of course you're going past the euphotic zone, right. past the level of photosynthesis. Right, there's no point, no point in keeping algae with you if there's no light, right? Well, <laughs> yeah, this is true. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, and you've, you've been doing some work around the island of Pohnpei, yes. I, I gather. And uh, why don't we jump into to sort of talking about what, what you sort of what you went there to find and then what you began to see? Yes, absolutely. So Ponape, just to uh, so people can know where Ponape is, um, it's uh, it's very much in the Pacific, right. and uh, uh, it's um, it's in Micronesia, and Micronesia covers three million square mile square miles in between Hawaii and the Philippines. So there's some very, very interesting distributions of animals within themselves within Micronesia, because essentially you've only got like 430 square miles actually of land, right. all the rest is ocean. So it's like, well, you've got to look at a whole bunch of different things, such as how they're so biologically successful, how do they get from one to the next island and atoll. Lots of questions. Very, very exciting. People, you, you can find end, endemism where species will only live on a particular location or a particular region. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of that here in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So Ponape is very, very interesting for that. And 
Um, the islands that I particularly work on, um, which should be, we, we can see shortly, are the, it's Ponape Island and its sister atolls and Anne Paquin. And, uh, and that should be in a figure very soon. And, uh, and this is part of the Caroline Islands. And so the, the thing is with Micronesia is you've got islands and they're grouped into the next islands. There's a hierarchy in essence. <laughs> Uh, so you've got the Caroline Islands and then the Ponape, which is an island, and then its two sister atolls, Pakin and, At and um, Ant, are the uh, Senyavin Islands, which are uh, named after uh, Russian. Um, and so this is the research that I wanted to come and talk to you about today, because uh, um, I've been there for a few years now and conducting some very interesting research, um, mainly on my interest of the Gorgonians mm -hmm. and collaborating with other researchers in different regions. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, first, I think it would be really good to sort of start describing the depth differentiation of what one would see, uh, particularly on an oceanic island and atoll, because sure. it's very, very sheer. So we should have a figure showing us that very shortly. And shallow waters, you know, they're typically defined by scuba. And when I mean that, it's how deep people tend to go on scuba. What are their limits before they start to feel the uh, detrimental physical effects? So usually between about 30 to 40 meters, around 100 uh, or so feet. Um, and most of the research uh, in terms of marine biology of shallow water reefs uh, is conducted here. Then, if you wanted to go off and then venture down to much deeper depths, people tend to use submarines, ROVs, and things like that. And they can be about $40,000 a day. So if you're going to spend all that money, you want to go deep, right. yeah, really deep, you know, 1,000 meters plus. So there's this kind of in-between zone, which we call like the twilight zone, or it's now officially called the mesophotic coral ecosystems. Okay. And, uh, and this is the zone that I do quite a bit of work in and that I use uh, my rebreather in order to go and research the animals that are there. So, and they're mainly Gorgonian corals, like fields of them. Hmm. Yeah. So the, the reed breather allows you to go, go to that depth, stay down long enough yes. to, to make it worthwhile, basically. Yes, yes. Okay. And of course, they're very quiet as well, which is very good. Okay. And it's, it's um, to put it simply, for those that aren't familiar with reed breathers, because they are becoming to be more uh, accessible to divers, um, is... Uh, they, it's like they have the gases are tailor-made for the depths that we go to and keep us coming up safely. Okay. Um, and, and that enables us to be able to stay down uh, uh, longer okay. and conduct the, the work that we need to conduct. But of course, when you're, uh, if you're going to go and dive deep, there's going to be an obligation to, to what we call decompression right. um, up into the shallows. And I can spend like a few hours in the shallows decompressing. Uh -huh. And there is a good opportunity to do additional research and characterize the reef, reefs across a bathymetric range. Uh -huh. So before we continue, there's, I've got some footage and I wanted to show you this footage to give you an idea of what the, the mesophotic or twilight reefs actually look like on the oceanic and, um, atolls and islands uh, around Ponape State. Yes. So, yes, so here, those are the uh, indigenous people of Pakin who are very generous, and there's the atoll. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a stunning, stunning place. They had never seen a drone before. They called it a little helicopter. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> And to see their faces having a whole new like, perspective of where they live was quite priceless. Huh. Yeah, they That's right, because they would never have seen this stuff. Quite. Yeah. Quite, exactly. Huh. Um, yeah, it was wonderful. And there's Manta Rays, a good friend of mine, Julie Hartup, who's the uh, president and director of the Micronesian Conservation Coalition and doing some work with her in Yap. And, and she studies these animals huh. and, uh, yeah, magnificent, yeah. And wonderful thing. Yeah. So here are the Gorgonians that I was referring to earlier. And as you can see, they're, they're, they can, they're like trees in many ways. And we're just descending down. Uh, this is Ant Atoll, uh, which has only got about eight people, I think, living on it. This is about 140 meters. And watch for the shark. There we go. <laughs> I was planning to go in that cave. <laughs> you decided not to. I then, changed huh? my mind. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And in the background there is uh, Brian Green and Dr. Richard Pyle, and they're catching uh, new species of fish to science. Mm -hmm. 
And here's some more of the Gorgonians down. We're 148 going down to 150 meters now. And, uh, and so you get some very unique coral, mm -hmm. very different. And it's a very different environment. And this is a very uh, popular aquarium fish that mm -hmm. uh, people like very, very much. And you can find them in crevices. And you actually find like huge scores of them uh, further down, further deep, mm -hmm. deeper on packing. Um, here you can see the fields and the diversity of the Gorgonians. There's a lot of different shapes and sizes, um, but it just goes on and on and on. And so this is my primary area of research. So that's what, what you were saying. They're actually very successful, although people don't see them because... Out of sight, right, out yeah, of mind. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Excellent. And so uh, these corals thrive, you say, without their little algal partners, basically, mm -hmm, in general. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that's sort of an interesting twist. We always think of corals as being this symbiotic partnership, but mm -hmm. obviously it's a, not a requirement then. Well, no, actually, the vast majority of coral taxa, coral species, are actually azoxanthellate oh, okay. and found below 50 meters oh, depth. Okay. Yeah. So, 64% um, of the coral species um, are actually, actually from the Octocorallia, oh, wow. and only 14% of corals are actually Scaratinians, which are the hard corals that, that, that form reefs. That doesn't make them any less right. important. Right. It just means that there's a huge proportion of biodiversity that is much deeper, and it's, it's, very, yeah, yeah. it's very telling. You know, it's like the big animals and the shallow and in-your-face animals everybody wants to know right. all about, of course. But it's very similar with microbiology, um, which is, is fascinating and, um, and lends further to some of my research that I'm doing with the Gorgonians. Um, people know less deeper and less smaller the yeah. animal is. Right, right. And yeah, the, well, the less, organism. Right, less people know about it, less people tend to care about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but they, they're often... Um, like the impact of the the uh, the, the microbial uh, communities within an animal or right. on an animal is well, is begin. integral and fundamental to its existence. Right, right. We have what ten times as many cells that aren't our own within us and on us as we have of our own. I know. You know? <laughs> <laughs> People don't like to think here that they don't like to think about that. <laughs> well, only if they're against us, right. but most of them are our friends. Right, right. <laughs> indeed, indeed, right. Yeah. So. Um, during during this work, as you were you were both looking at your own Gorgonians and also sort of characterizing the, the different uh, assemblages at different depths, mm. you also did this over several years, right? Yeah. And yes. that's uh, one of those years was right during a big uh, El Nino event, right? Yes, it was. So I've been putting down temperature loggers every 10 meters from 10 meters of a depth, 30 feet down to 140 meters. So here you can see from uh, just August 2015 to August uh, 2016, you can use sort of slides over there, um, there was quite a temperature anomaly. As yeah. you can see, yeah. not all the depths are there because um, they often get consumed, my loggers. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you can see this data was, was absolutely fascinating. Right. And I took one look at that and some, in some parts, the diurnal temperature or the daily temperature variance um, can be, at its extreme, 20 degrees centigrade within a day. Wow. Usually averaging within a day around 10 degrees centigrade mm -hmm. is the variance. That's kind of like the, the lowest variance that you will get, and that's around 90 meters. Mm -hmm. But typically, I mean, I was astonished when I saw that data, but the most thing you'll see from that graph is that it shot up. In right. March 2016. Right. I mean, it just absolutely shot up. So even at 130 meters of depth, mm -hmm. um, which is, I think, excuse my trans, it's, it's like 426 mm -hmm. or something, is um, it actually went up to 30 degrees centigrade, which is the temperature you would find in the shallow reef. Yeah. yeah, amazing. And that mm -hmm. was right when sort of the whole drought was really hitting badly. Absolutely. Uh, uh, above above the surface. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I was actually out in Palau at that time. And right. Under, or reservoir was dead dry, basically. Yes, yeah, so much yeah. um, mortality. Yeah. A lot. We're going we're gonna to continue this conversation in just a moment, but I'm told we need to take a brief break. Uh, I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Likeable Science. With me today is Tony Rowley. We'll be right back.
afternoon. My name is Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green, a program on Think Tech Hawaii. We show at 3 o'clock in the afternoon every other Monday. My guests are specialists both from here and the mainland on energy efficiency, which means you do more for less electricity and you're generally safer and more comfortable while you're keeping dollars in your pocket. Welcome back here to Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today in the studio is Dr. Sonia Rolby. She studies Gorgonian corals, uh, or maybe just more properly Gorgonians, I guess. Uh, these uh, particular at uh, in the mesophotic region, you said, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this twilight region below 100, 120 feet, going mm -hmm. down to until it turns sort of pitch dark, right? Oh yes, absolutely. I mean, the thing is, um, there are. Um, I mean, you can get uh, gorgonians actually, the zooxanthellate ones, right. uh, the photosynthetic um, the ones that have photosynthetic um, symbionts. Um, they can dominate the reefs um, in other other regions, in many regions. But the ones that we're talking about here, especially um, across the, the Indo-Pacific and the Oceanic mm -hmm. Islands and atolls of Ponape, which we're discussing today, um, they really come into their own uh, when you get down to deeper depths. Yeah. Um, and particularly, I was very fascinated um, with how they are so tolerant to temperature. I mean, to be honest with you, I was fascinated with it anyway. And before the break, we saw that these animals essentially are huge, uh, are, are living in an environment which is hugely thermally dynamic. I mean, very, very changeable. So one of the things I want to know is how are they so biologically successful? Mm -hmm. But the other thing that I'd noticed from the El Nino event, essentially, when it sh the temperatures shot up, uh, not only at those depths, but also in the shallows, mm -hmm. is it's like, how did everything survive? Right. And from 2006, the shallow reefs were just stunning, and, um, and particularly on the, on the atolls. So there's, uh, I've got a picture here from the uh, atoll, Pakin Atoll. And uh, in 2006, you can see that there's still beautiful, thriving reefs, even though other areas of the Indo-Pacific were having strong, strong bleaching. Uh, Palau also noticed that bleaching wasn't really affected um, at this point. However, when we returned the following year, this year, the reefs were just dead. So even though they're a very pretty pink, basically they were covered with crustose coralline algae. And when you just nick off a little bit from the branches, this is Isopora pilifera, and when you, you break that off, um, it's very th thin, but the, the crustose coralline algae, I mean, it grew that fast. It was actually growing over the halomeda, which is another algae. Mm. You know, I mean, it was just, it was remarkable that the, the whole reefs were like this pink mortuary. Mm. Uh, I mean, it was, uh, I, I was quite shocked, actually, because I got some coral researchers coming over, uh, from Ames and to research on the corals, and I was like, um, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, fortunately, we did find some new species to science at depth, which was huh. good. Um, it's still, I mean, it's low-hanging fruit at depth right. uh, for that. So, so what's the prognosis for that, I mean, that shallower reef? When mm. it's... Well, it's, it's very, very difficult. Um, the good thing is that, um, you know, larval settlement favors crustose coralline algae. But in other, other reefs, they did not fare so well. Um, and, you know, I wanted to sort of, uh, I, we have some images that can um, show basically what happened there, what was happening with the other reefs. Um, now, this is also what's happening at depth. So 2016, um, you can see at 30 meters, um, actually down to, to 60, you would see this band of um, filamentous cyanobacteria. And that, I was actually running experiments at the time, uh, which we have time we can talk about afterwards, but I was quite uh, astonished. I, all my experiments were just completely smothered. Uh, but you didn't see a signature of this in the shallows in 2016. You just saw gorgeous reefs. Mm -hmm. But then in 2017, that cyanobacteria got uh, completely smothered by um, algae, this mm -hmm. green invasive algae, mm -hmm. microdictyon. Um, and the, the two images at the bottom 
were below 65 meters or below. So here I was just doing some monitoring, and there's two uh, species uh, of uh, coral, Seriata pora, Seriata pora hystrix. Get my get my um, <laughs> get my tongue around some of these names, <laughs> and then also Siphonogorgia. So we've got a, a, a Scleractinian and um, an octocoral uh, right next to each other, and you can see it was just you know nice. You know, nothing bad was happening there. And lots and lots of new recruits. But then following year, at the same depth, same place, you've got this microdiction which is just dominating those depths. So the upper twilight zone or the upper mesophotic was basically carpeted by microdiction. Um, the year previous, as you see in 2016, mm -hmm. um, this kind of shallower band, but still in the mesophotic, it was like, the mesophotic zone is essentially a signature that things were not happy on the reefs. Mm. And um, so even though in the shallows, the scleractinians looked fine for all intents and purposes, obviously there was this latent effect because they completely sort of decimated the following year. It was just quite interesting to see uh, like a, you know, a premonition signature right. at depth. Yeah, it's um, fascinating. The... It, it really speaks to the interconnectedness of the of mm. those regions, right? That yeah. that the lower reef is feeding something up in the upper reef, mm. and when it's being impacted, then it just takes a while before that. Sort of it's interesting sort of... the dynamics. There's right. still much that we absolutely don't know. Yeah. That's the thing. I've been doing a lot of different environmental mm -hmm. monitoring, mm -hmm. um, and. Um, and it's, you know, you get these huge swaths of chlorophyll that, that come through at 90 meters depth, but you don't get them in the shallows. Mm -hmm. You know, you get um, the dissolved oxygen can go really, really, really low the deeper you go, but the oscillations can be really high yeah. within a day. Yeah, that's intriguing. You think of the depth of the ocean as being absolutely sort of stable, at least I have mm. that in my mind, is it should be just sort of yeah. fixed. And your, your work is showing it's a very dynamic place. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I first, um, when we first started going there, and I was like, right, there's this one particular species uh, called Anella. And, uh, and it means angel in Hawaii, and, uh, and I really like it. And I've, uh, and it, uh, you know, and I've chopped it up and put it up in lots of different places and all sorts. It's a real good um, model species for me to play with. And, so, and I noticed that it seemed, it, it, I, I would find its distribution from the shallow waters, as shallow as five meters, like um, really down 150 meters plus. I mean, it would just be, and I'd be like, wow, that really traverses some serious uh, right. temperatures. But through um, looking at these temperature variances, it obviously has a, a certain degree of vet temperature uh, tolerance right. to this thermal dynamic um, environments. I mean, it really, really is. But to to find it's to such an extent was quite astonishing. People were like you say, the deeper you go, you think it's uh, it's benign, but far from it. Right. Far from it. You've yeah. got these internal wave structures. Uh, so you've got like essentially you've got the shallow wheat reef um, water proper, and then you've got these internal waves. You've got this oceanic um, uh, physical oceanographic influence that's coming in. Okay. Yeah. Now, this is, this is such intriguing stuff that, that you're doing, and it's so important to learn about it. But it really speaks to what we don't know out there, right? Mm. I mean, how, how it seems like every day you're discovering sort of that there's bigger and bigger worlds out there of, yeah, yeah. of the unknowns, yeah. which is, that's of course one of the jobs of science, right? Yeah, it's, quite. Is to keep opening up those horizons. So before we, before we jump out of this entirely, I want, I want to hit you with a, a very odd, off the wall question. Ah. Mm. So, if you were to have a superpower and you could either fly or be invisible, which would you choose and why? Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, God, I want both. Probably. Um, <laughs> that's really tough. That's super, super tough. Um, I would fly if I could go underwater. Oh, OK. There yeah. we go. <laughs> yeah, perspective. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and be invisible. So yeah, that's cheating. <laughs> Sorry, I just had, had to drop it in. Uh, I'm reminded we have one more photo that you had wanted to share, so we'll do that in, in the last minute here. Okay, okay, please do. Right, so basically the point I was trying to make here is when you get past 70 meters plus, the, uh, the assemblages are still the same. You've still got all these gorgeous Gorgonians, fields of them. 
and, uh, and so my research continues to pursue how they are so biologically successful. And one of my um, hypotheses that I'm working on at the moment is I believe it's due to their microbiome. Ah, okay. So all the little things in them and on them are really... Yes, because they have a, a huge percentage of them that are, they appear to be, um, I wouldn't say obligate because I haven't got that far yet, right. but wherever I seem to put them, they seem to have the same friends. Uh -huh. And they also, I believe that they're gardening bacteria um, due to their anatomical um, limitations and so forth. Uh -huh. And so really, because they're really bad at catching large zooplankton, they uh -huh. don't do it very well, they're not equipped to do it, they couldn't mm -hmm. really catch a cold. So what are they eating? It must uh -huh. be microbes. Uh -huh. Or more to the point, they've got this symbiotic reciprocal uh, pathways. Yeah. No, it makes sense, right? Yeah. Just, just as they may co-opt algae for, to make food, they also can co-opt bacteria at depth, you're saying. Well, we have the same right. thing right. in our bowel. Yeah. Why wouldn't it's, they have it in theirs? Exactly. Yeah. exactly. You know, it's, it's, it's an old game, apparently. Yeah, yeah it's more and more prevalent. I think yeah. that's the discovery. That's the exploration yeah. right there. Yeah, uh, and finding these, uh, I mean, it's a big push now, right? Finding these broad rules that really run life. And, yes. and one of them appears to be that, yeah, sort of nothing exists by itself. Quite, or, 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 quite, yeah. Was it that lovely phrase, only you alone can do it, but you cannot do it alone? Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, well, this has been just fascinating stuff. Uh, great to get you back here. And uh, as we spoke of before the show, you we were talking about some other work that you're doing that we'll have to get you back here again yes. to talk about because you, you do so much really interesting stuff. Oh, thank you very <laughs> much. Yeah. So thank you so much for, for taking the time, because I know you are busy, 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 <laughs> and it's wonderful to, to have you back on the show again here. Thank you so much, and uh, we look forward to getting you back yet again. Oh, well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And we hope uh, you'll come back next week and be with us for another episode of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. Until then.